such a great meeting. Uh, so we will give uh, share, um, we will change a little bit the environment that uh, uh, we will talk about. And uh, first of all, um, maybe just before I start, few nice pictures of Slovenia, the, the, the neighboring country of Italy where I come from. But what I want to talk about uh, today is uh, soil bacteria. And we work with uh, soil bacterium uh, Bacillus satilis uh, for quite a while. And uh, the approach we use in our uh, work <coughs> is actually uh, that we isolate bacteria from a small spaces, like from uh, soil grains. Uh, and from each grain, we isolate different strains of Bacillus subtilis. Uh, and the aim uh, was to really understand social interactions between these strains. At that time, when we started to do this work, uh, we were studying quorum sensing. And diversity of uh, quorum sensing specificity types that we find in bacilli, namely ferrotypes. And from this picture, you can see from the color codes that even within the species you have in a small uh, area uh, many so called ferrotypes. And the same is true if you look at the rhizosphere of one plant. Uh, it is uh, the diversity of these uh, social types uh, is present. Now, in addition, uh, when we have now these populations uh, of bacteria, we try to understand how they behave in multicellular groups. Namely, uh, we study swarming or also uh, biofilms. Uh, being colonies or biofilms on plant roots or uh, actually as pellicles. And the two uh, social uh, behaviors we addressed most often is one which I already mentioned to you. This is so-called quorum sensing. Uh, I, I don't need to repeat what it is, but it's a cell density dependent behavior which depends on accumulation of signals. And uh, in gram positives, the signaling molecules are peptides. And I just want to uh, mention my student, Micha uh, Spatzapan, who is in the audience, and he's here. He was presenting a poster on uh, the role of these peptides in uh, inducing proteases and biofilm regulation, actually proteases mainly on this poster, and how these proteases regulate uh, potentially the stability of these peptides. Uh, but today, uh, I will talk about the other topic we do in our lab and uh, try to explore, and this is so-called kin discrimination. And uh, the work was presented, part of it, uh, by Maya Bulyashic, who is also in the lab. And if you have questions about it, you can also ask her. But a lot of work on this topic that I will talk about uh, today has been done by my uh, more senior, two senior uh, researchers in the lab, Apolonza Stefanic and Krieger Barber, Barbara Krieger, sorry. So kin discrimination uh, is a mechanism where you have uh, recognition between cells and then differential behavior uh, upon this recognition to, between uh, the interacting uh, species or st strains, actually. But so it is all based on cooperative behaviors, uh, which have been uh, discussed during this conference as such that are susceptible to uh, exploitation by cheaters. And a uh, long time ago, Hamilton proposed that kin discrimination might be a mechanism, assortment mechanism, which can protect uh, this um, the populations from uh, invasion by cheaters which are not kin. 
Uh, and so uh, the process uh, then uh, results in the fact that two populations can, if they are non kill uh, differentially uh, behave towards the other, or if they are keen, they can assist each other and thus better coordinate the group behavior. Now, what I would like to talk to you about today are three topics. Uh, first, I will um, explain how we discovered this phenomena in uh, the population of Bacillus subtilis, uh, actually community of strains that we isolated. And uh, I will talk about a mechanism that we find uh, occurs during uh, strain interactions that are uh, non-keen. And uh, at the end, I would like to uh, touch upon the, on the topic, uh, what are the social consequences when these uh, strains interact in multicellular settings? Now, uh, if uh, we have um, a population of uh, strains which are coming from the same environment, uh, we ask ourselves, could we detect uh, that between these strains a differential treatment which would correlate also with their phylogenetic relatedness? And so the first thing, of course, that was necessary to do was the determination of phylogenetic relatedness between these strains. And as I told you before, they are all bacillus subtilis, and therefore they are highly similar at the level of phylogenetic genes. But still, the, 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 the 39 strains that we use to address this question uh, have been previously determined by us and in collaboration with Fred Cohen from United States, that even at this small area of one cubic centimeter, you can find three ecological types of Bacillus subtilis. So we took these strains and then we uh, asked ourselves whether we can, by, in, during their cooperative swarming, evaluate interactions. And at that time, it was already known that, for example, during uh, Protus mirabilis swarming, you can uh, detect these uh, boundaries th that come uh, between uh, strains uh, when they uh, touch upon each other, as well as in mixobacterial compa uh, compatibility tests. So we used the strains, we inoculated them at different uh, spots or areas of the uh, agar plate that induces, an uh, agar media that induces swarming. And uh, so we indeed found this uh, phenotype that we predicted it will be there. So uh, there is this boundary, dramatic boundary between strains that are different and we don't see such a boundary. We see merging between uh, uh, the same, the swarms of the same strain. So Barbara went on and tested uh, in all possible combinations the 39 strains that we had. And uh, of course, she did it many times. And at the end, she came out with the following matrix. Uh, before that, I would also like to say that when we did these uh, uh, interactions, actually Barbara did them, there were two, three uh, different phenotypes, very strong boundary, a little less pronounced one, and no boundary, which we call merging. And the, the, the uh, relatedness, actually I will say this first, so when we, uh, when we compare these strains, and now the color codes are uh, labeled uh, according to the ecotype, and within ecotype, strains are more phylogenetically related. What we saw is that uh, 
these groups that you see here, so in here, the strains always merged. But when you have two circles, strains formed a boundary. Uh, and you can see that boundaries would always occur but, uh, between ecotypes. We, we don't uh, see uh, any merging between ecotypes ever. But within one ecotype, for example, the yellow one, you can see that there are more kin groups, as we call them. So the diversity of social interactions uh, at the level of recognition or this differential treatment is much higher. It's 12 kin groups among 39 strains. And this is very similar, uh, that, uh, which was found already by Voss and Welliser in 2009, where they did, uh, looked at uh, mixobacterial uh, isolates from a soil patch of a little bit bigger patch of 16 centimeters by 16 centimeters. Now, if we um, looked uh, and compared the phylogenetic genes of these strains very carefully in pairwise combinations and ask ourselves uh, what kind of identity will correlate with the merging uh, so this is here indicated yellow merging with the intermediate uh, phenotype or the boundary, which is indicated blue. And from this uh, picture, you can already see that majority of interactions were like uh, resulting in the boundary formation. And merging would only occur in higher frequencies. And here you can see the frequencies. Uh, when there was 100% identity between uh, phylogenetic genes, and then it dropped significantly. And below 99.4% uh, identity between two genes in the pairwise combinations, you would never ever see any more the merging. So phylogenetic genes are not involved in these interactions. They are just reflection of the evolution of this population, suggesting that as the population uh, evolves, uh, they, there is a higher and higher frequency uh, possibility that, that they will be antagonistic. But even if they are 100% identical at the phylogenetic genes, you can still see, you see, for example, here one uh, boundary or several uh, intermediate types. So the next question, when we saw this uh, nice distribution of like boundaries and merging, and which suggested to us that actually uh, the mechanism behind correlates with, uh, uh, with the evolution of, of these strains, we asked ourselves, could we uh, detect also mechanisms that are responsible for these uh, phenotypes for so-called kin discrimination. And the approach we used here in collaboration with, with uh, Roberto Coulter's lab uh, in United States, uh, I would especially like to acknowledge Nick uh, Lyons, his very uh, talented postdoc, and here is Barbara from my uh, lab who has also done the same kind of experiments. And we both did transposon mutagenesis in different strains, and uh, as well as reverse genetics, and then compared our results and talked about what we see. And the approach we used with transposon metagenesis was such that a strain, a parental strain would be used, it would be mutated, and then we would look for boundary formation between ancestor and, and, the, uh, and the mutant. And uh, doing these kind of experiments, uh, it was found that the, the loci that were responsible for, for, uh, for this boundary formation could be um, grouped into three groups uh, 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 functionally. And this is uh, toxin immunity genes, okay, which is not that surprising. For example, in Bacillus swap A is the most interesting maybe for this in this respect, which is a contact dependent 
toxin immunity uh, function uh, and is also polymorphic between strains. And then th these are like uh, killing also, um, also toxin immunity genes. And then there is a group of surface components, uh, genes that are involved, for example, in uh, synthesis of uh, tehoic acid or genes involved in synthesis of extracellular polymers, the polysaccharides that are present on the surface. And finally, here are regulatory genes, many of which actually regulate uh, these uh, functions. So at the end, we could conclude that there are three groups of genes, antimicrobial cell surface and response regulation uh, genes that are controlling this function. The question was then, okay, we see these antimicrobial genes uh, that, are, that might be important. Are the antagonistic uh, interactions the main drivers of kin discrimination between uh, uh, bacillus uh, strains? Is there any cell damage in the cell boundary that we see? Uh, and, uh, and this is another picture of the cell boundary. So uh, here... Um, uh, Nick has done an, uh, an experiment where he looked at cells in the boundary or between uh, two kin strains, uh, and he found that between kin strains, uh, there is uh, less, for example, propidium iodide stain cells indicating less uh, dead cells than if you look at the number of propidium iodide stain cells in the boundary. And uh, we have done an experiment where we looked with electron microscopy what's happening actually at the boundary. And you can see these cells here are much different than the cells in the swarm. So in the boundary, the cells look like kind of empty bags, suggesting that there is some antagonism going on. This correlates also with the transcriptional activities that were uh, tested within the boundary, and I will not go into the details. I just want to show you one example, uh, which is, for example, expression of sigma W uh, gene between two strains when they interact and they are non-kin. Sigma W is a sigma factor responsible for the adaptation to enveloped the, to the stress which occurs at the envelope level. And you can see that very high induction of the sigma W in one of the strains. And that's what happens usually. When two strains meet, one responds widely, the other actually doesn't change its genes that much. So it seems like one is attacking and the other is less, uh, is, is then responding to this attack. Uh, now, if uh, strains are compared, uh, which are phylogenetically, they are still very closely related within the species or subspecies, but if we uh, compare strains and say, okay, let's uh, compare su in such a way that they would de decrease with, uh, in phylogenetic relatedness, we see that the boundaries here, they become more prominent. And, uh, with the distance. So the very closely related strains, they still merge, and then you can see some, line, uh, some boundary and the, the increase in boundary prominence. And Nick did uh, one very interesting com uh, comparison using bioinformatics, taking uh, the g genome of a uh, lab strain that has been used to study biofilms a lot in the bacillus community of scientists. And here are listed genes that are actually known genes encoding antibiotic or antagonistic functions. It doesn't really matter their names. What's important here is that here are the strains listed also in the order so that phylogeny uh, relatedness drops in this uh, direction. And the gray uh, areas represent the similarity and white areas represent like missing, the, 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 the strain is missing, the gene. And you can see that as the phylogenetic relatedness uh, drops, so does the common number of antagonistic uh, genes in, in these genomes. Uh, 
um, compares, of course, here uh, towards uh, to the to the reference strain. And so, uh, with the boundary prominence, as I told you before, uh, uh, the boundary prominence in, increases. Now, we wanted to know if we, for example, have two non-kin and then inactivate uh, genes that we predict are involved in one, could we actually merge them back? Could we make non-kin kin again? And that has been a very, very difficult task. And the only time we, could, uh, we were successful to do this was when we used very closely related uh, strain, PC216, which uh, is only different between uh, this uh, lab strain uh, in, in this area of SP beta prophage, and namely the sublensin locus, which encodes also an antibiotic. So uh, here is the interaction between wild type strain and PC26 strain. You see some boundary not very strong. If we now inactivate the sublensin uh, gene, which is present in the in this uh, focal strain, then we found that indeed you can reverse the phenotype and uh, the, the strains become uh, like mergers uh, or kin, as we call them also. With, so if we, if we found now these three types of uh, groups of genes, how does this uh, knowledge correlates with the knowledge that is already available in the literature about uh, on kin discrimination in other organisms? And there are two mechanisms uh, which have been studied so far. Mostly, uh, for example, polymorphic receptors have been indicated as means that that strains which are keen can find each other and uh, therefore increase their probability of interaction. In dictyostelium, in Myxococcus xanthus, for example, the TRA receptor uh, uh, responsible for the outer membrane exchange uh, or uh, flow one gene in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Or there are also indications of immunity to the effectors uh, strategies in Proteus mirabilis, for example, this, uh, this group which has done uh, the contact dependent killing as uh, uh, proposed the contact dependent killing as the mechanism to uh, line formation, but also from the laboratory of Karina Gibbs. Uh, who proposed that actually these IDS uh, genes that she discovered in collaboration with Pete Greenberg are not the killing machine, but rather uh, proteins that are able to uh, help two strains to identify each other as kin if they are the same. But in Bacillus, we have a little bit different system, as at least at this point when we look at it, and we call it combinatorial system. Many loci are involved in kin discrimination. That's uh, what we find. Uh, so far, we have not found any such strong uh, receptors that would uh, bring the cells together, but they might exist. That uh, it's very possible. Uh, and um, uh, so what we believe is that uh, strains forming boundary or, or, for uh, encode a different set of kin discrimination loci. And this is uh, not one or two or three. We think it's many more uh, loci that are involved and that these loci are highly dynamic in their existence. It's not that one strain will have them three loci all the time. It will, they will change due to horizontal gene transfer. That's our hypothesis. And uh, why we think there are many loci? Because it's very difficult to switch uh, non-kin to kin, because uh, mutations in kin discrimination loci, that, and these are the same mutations that we in, introduce into different strains uh, of Bacillus subtilis can give very different phenotypes. So uh, that suggests that they have other partners with them, and uh, that there is uh, 
also high asymmetry in the expression uh, of KD loci when, we, when uh, transcriptomic is performed, but I have not talked about this much. So to conclude uh, with this, I would say that number of shared antimicrobials and immunities is the key determinant of the bacillus subtilis skin discrimination system. Okay, so uh, why, what would that uh, do? Maybe uh, this kind of system would prevent uh, mixing, random mixing, which would be detrimental to the uh, community of different strain and would stabilize the cooperation within uh, uh, the group of kin, uh, kin cells. So if, uh, if we propose now that when kin meet, they actually are happy, they are doing well, and when non-kin meet, uh, meet uh, then the outcome is a bit different, they don't want that non-kin get close to them, uh, what, what would actually happen uh, in more real settings if we now really mix them together, not try to compete them one uh, against each other on the agar surface as we did here? So we did experiments with plants, uh, which are more realistic systems, like we used Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, and uh, we inoculated this uh, uh, these uh, plants uh, with, uh, we actually put the plant into the medium that was then inoculated with strains, and after a certain period of time, uh, then the, the uh, uh, spatial distribution of these strains has been looked at. And you can see that strains were labeled with fluorescent markers constitutively expressed, uh, and here uh, the names of the strains indicate if they are the same. So here are kin or self. So you can see that in this kind of combination you could all, you, will, you see always both uh, types of, I mean both cells present, they are, uh, they are kin. Or if you have even different strains but they are kin, uh, defined uh, by the a swarming assay, they also coexist and form this cluster on the, um, on the root. This is not the case when non kin are mixed in, in this uh, setting, because then uh, we, sorry, uh, we see only one uh, strain prevailing on the root. Uh, and uh, here again, another one has won in this, in this competition. If we do these uh, assays on, on the swarming plate, uh, this time mixing strains and inoculating them in the middle of the plate, again, the strains are labeled with different markers. So uh, the prediction would be that, again, there would be competition between non-kin and maybe coexistence of kin. Uh, and after 24 hours, if we look under the dissecting microscope at these uh, mixtures, yes, indeed, the kin always stay together. They, they swarm together, and th that's why the color on the plate of the colony is yellow. But we don't see this phenotype if we mix non-kin. In non-kin combinations, always one or the other wins. Sometimes we see sectoring, but this sectoring is always present only when we mix non-kin, not when we mix kin. So this is, these strains, these cells are moving. They are not fixed. They are mixing, but not very well if they are non-kin. They then move also sometimes in these separate uh, sectors over the plate. Uh, the territoriality uh, is achieved only, obviously through competition because uh, it, who wins in the assay between non-kin is very much dependent on the frequency of one of the strains. So if one would be, uh, here is only four to one ratio and this one would always win. You see if you mix kin, this does not happen. You just see the ratio are preserved uh, between kin. And uh, 
Finally, uh, maybe I, uh, I will say a few words also about uh, mixing of kin and non-kin in a static culture. Here, a static culture, we grow uh, cells uh, statically and they form pellicles on the surface of, of the liquid medium. Again, they are uh, labeled with different fluorescent markers. And uh, Maya, Barbara, and Istok have done this, uh, this work. What we see here is a little bit different than in swarming assays. We see coexistence of uh, kin, of course, that's predicted, they mix well, but also we see that non-kin coexist in this pellicle, only the size of the patches is very different. It's larger uh, uh, but when non-kin are mixed. So here mixing is, is very very close, and if we go at 12 micrometers distance, we would, in kin combinations, always see two colors, but this would not be in non-kin combinations where it would be one or the other. And such mixing uh, uh, also has consequences for fitness, uh, not as dramatic as in swarming assay, where one is just wiped out almost, uh, most often, but uh, here, what we see is that if we mix skin, so these are two, the, the fitness does not change much. Both strains have the coexist well. And in non-kin combinations that form like this very strong boundary, one would be a, a loser. The other wouldn't gain so much, but one would be the loser. In this kind of boundary uh, pairs, uh, there is uh, still uh, good coexistence. So with uh, this, I can slowly come to my uh, conclusions. And this is that kin discrimination that we discovered uh, shapes multicellular behaviors. It shapes how they uh, coexist, how they swarm. They swarm separately. So it also affects territoriality. And uh, finally, uh, we believe at the moment that antimicrobials and immunity pairs, which have to be uh, the same in kin and are different in non-kin, uh, in, uh, non are the main molecular uh, determinants of kin discrimination in bacillus. So um, with this in mind, I would... Uh, leave you with a take-home message, and that's gains and losses of social life depend on who you are interacting with. So, pick wisely.